London news agents. Nothing is really impossible if you put your mind to it. After all, as I once said, I was the future once. <laughs> and that was that. The end of David Cameron. We bid him a fond farewell in 2016. Or so we thought. It was a jaw-dropping, core f- me moment when the car pulls up in Downing Street. You see the Range Rover door open. And you think, oh, my God. It's David Cameron getting out, going into bloody number 10 Downing Street. Unbelievable plot shift that nobody saw coming. We thought we'd be talking about Suella and her demise today, but this one has pushed itself right to the top of our running order. We discuss it all. Welcome to the News Agents. It's John. It's Emily. And it's Lewis. And I just want to clear something up, having just listened to what you two just said. Anyone listening who might not have been completely glued to the news all morning, as we have been, might think that Cameron's back as Prime Minister. Just no, to be President. Absolutely clear. Actually, President, President of the UK. United, yes. Yeah. Uh, just to be absolutely clear, he's not back as Prime Minister. <laughs> he's actually back as Foreign Secretary. First time a Prime Minister has returned to office in some form since Alec Douglas Hume, who was barely Prime Minister for any time at all when he came back. Who was also a Prime Minister as Lord. In 1970. As a Lord, yeah. As a Lord, yeah. And the first time we've had a a Lord, uh, first time we've had a Foreign Secretary or a great office of state in the Lord, in the Lords rather than the Commons since 1982. We are tripping over ourselves to tell the story today, which I think gives you some sense of just what a morning it has been, Shea News Agents. Because everything that we learnt was superseded by something even more extraordinary. The Suella sacking happened, I think, by about 9am, didn't it? Yep. And then we watched the coming and going of people like James Cleverly, who is now... Poor James Cleverly. <laughs> Spare Poor, a no, thought. Wait, let's, before we go any further... Thoughts and prayers Cleverley, for James Cleverly. Exactly. He was having the loveliest time being Foreign Secretary, traversing the world, waving the flag for the United Kingdom. And doing quite and a good now, job, most people and, doing, thought, and now he gets the Home Office, that kind of... That has often been a sort of place where <laughs> politicians go to die because it's always so intractable dealing with the problems of, of prisons, of illegal immigration and all the rest Famously of it. not fit for purpose for exactly. a lot of it's the okay, time. It's OK, though, because he's not becoming Home Secretary at a particular contentious time or anything so it's, it's going to be it's going to be a nice easy baptism for him and we've been waiting for Therese Coffey to who we think got sent to the wrong part of Downing Street the part where you are normally promoted. going to be promoted or to be sort of gently side shuffled and we don't know if she is going to emerge as we speak as we record at half past 12 with a job But the Cameron thing was the moment. Well, you you know how when you listen to a podcast, you can sometimes alter the speed. So it's going at one and a half times normal rate. (laughs) No one does that with me. I think think that's the rate you're going to think it's listening to because we're all so... But we're not overexcited. No, we're not overexcited. I mean, what an extraordinary move by Rishi Sunak. So I'll give you one theory. Last week we're saying, where's that man's backbone? He's got no willpower. He's weak. He's being put upon by Suella Braverman. And now we're saying he's got balls of clanking steel because he's got rid of... He's brought David Cameron back into the government. and are you're saying balls of clanking steel. I'm saying... Can we stop saying balls of clanking steel, please? (laughs) Please. Have we all said at least once It's only Monday. I think it shows a sign of desperation, actually, And I'm not saying it's not a big move. And we saw it, I guess, famously when Gordon Brown brought Peter Mandelson back with the famous purple V-neck jumper and he put him also into the Lords to allow him to become his campaign manager. It was a sign then that Brown needed to press the nuclear button. And I think it's a sign now that Rishi Sunak feels he needs to press the nuclear button. We know that David Cameron has been very helpful to Rishi Sunak. He does tend to give... Conservative Prime Minister's his ear and I was told that early last week he was preparing to see Rishi Sunak I think on Wednesday. Very interesting to know whether that was the day that this was sort of cooked up or whether that was just a helpful thought and Rishi Sunak then kind of thought two days later or after the or after the protest at the weekend oh hang on a second he might be my favorite. Let me just add one thing to that which is that I spoke to someone who I spent most of Friday uh, with David Cameron and The way David Cameron was speaking was not of a man who thought he was going back into government. He was planning all sorts of other things that were coming up in the coming weeks where being foreign secretary would have been incompatible with what he was planning. And so I just kind of think that maybe this all came up over the weekend 
Um, he's just uh, walking past Downing Street. Rishi Sunak looks out the window and goes, hang on. Good idea. Come in here. <laughs> I mean, Matthew Paris wrote a column in the in the Times on Saturday, which was essentially saying, you've got to face down the right wing as Rishi Sunak. You've got to get a government back on the tracks. You've got to do this. And I think that maybe that is also look, part of it. Look, I mean, on one level, this has already succeeded, right? In the sense that were it not for this this move, which is like it's audacious, it's bold, it's doing something that no one, no one expected David Cameron to get out of that car this morning. When you know, when when journalists are assembled in Downing Street looking for the cabinet comings and goings, we thought there might be a reshuffle. No one expected David Cameron to get out of the car. It is actually also just in parenthesis a side note to how unleaky Sunak's number ten is that this didn't emerge at some point over the weekend. Lewis, let me just interrupt you there before we get into the additional complexity because it is just worth playing sky news reaction when the cars arrive in downing street and the door opens by car coming up number 10 uh downing street i should say not quite sure who this uh, might be uh, if somebody's sacked then of course they don't uh, come up downing street that's done in private that's the security detail just opening the door for David, David Cameron. Cameron. What? Wait. I was not expecting okay. that. <laughs> okay. And so it, what it has done is it has ensured that instead of talking about Suella Braverman's sacking and all of the internal uh, ructions within the Conservative Party that that is going to cause, and that will still come, by the way, but it does mean that tomorrow's papers will be dominated by this. As you say, John, it looks gutsy, it looks ballsy, it looks like Sunak is finally leading at a time when everyone was saying... He was uh, rudderless. But there is a complexity to it, which is David Cameron. David Cameron is not a political figure or a prime minister whose reputation and legacy is itself without complexity. It is complicated. He is widely disliked by a very strong section of the Conservative Party, a section of the Conservative Party, by the way, which is exactly going to be the bit of the Conservative Party, which is irate about Suella Braverman's sacking. He is, in terms of his kind of reputation within the public at large, it isn't that great. If you look at the polling, uh, he does pretty badly in terms of where his reputation is now. Leavers tend to dislike him, if we go back to the Brexit question. Remainers tend to blame him for Brexit. And when you are Sunak, who as recently as six weeks ago was premising his premiership around the idea of being change, that he is in some way embodying change, to bring back the guy who was first elected as Conservative Party leader in 2005 yeah, I mean, is a complicated sure. message let's, to sell. Let's not forget that the last intervention we had from David Cameron was absolutely irate Slamming when Sunak. he had cancelled HS2, which was, David Cameron thought, his legacy. Now, Maybe David Cameron thinks that HS2 is his legacy. Most people will think, I mean, not least about his performance in foreign affairs as being Quite. his legacy. You don't think of David Cameron as having the best history of relations with the EU. If he had, clearly the whole referendum might have been different. He might have brought back something extraordinary to offer up to a people before the referendum. He couldn't. You think of his input during the Arab Spring, Libya, an absolute mess, Syria and Assad, absolutely unbridled. So I'm not really sure at what point you think he's got this amazing China. China very close relationship with China, now very Osborne, controversial on, on the Tory benches. Absolutely. Were, were, were you know, the whole banquet thing to, to cuddle up to Huawei. Golden I mean, age. Hua exactly. Huawei was was the, the bit of, of China, Chinese government that Cameron wanted to bring but, right but, into the heart of this but, but, country. But, but. Rishi Senek has got to fight a general election next year or maybe very, very early in 2025. Yesterday morning, I sat at home and I watched the Remembrance Day service because I kind of find it incredibly moving. Maybe that's where he had the idea. And and there you have... <laughs> Which of these shall I go for? <laughs> and there you have six former prime ministers and one current prime minister, only three of whom have won a general election. Yeah. Blair, Cameron and Johnson. Cameron has won Good twice. Point. Cameron isn't just going to be the foreign secretary. We've talked about at the Grant Shapps reshuffle that he would be the minister for the Today programme and going around the studios. Cameron is a brilliant performer like that. So Cameron will do all of that. But the baggage he brings with him is, one, this is very much the last roll of the dice if you're Rishi Sunak. You, what, what else can you do? Two, as Lewis says, this is the end of the whole party conference strategy, which is, I am the change candidate, yeah. when you've just dug up one of the bodies... So that lasted one month. That lasted one month. 
And the other thing that I think people will notice is the Conservative Party is back under the control of patrician Tories. Yeah. Rishi Sunak, Wickhamist. Uh, Jeremy Hunt, Cartusian, who went to Charterhouse. Cartesian or Cartusian? Cartusian, I think. Oh, I, right. I don't know what they've done. I've never heard that word before. Well, you went to Charterhouse. I think he's a Cartesian. And you've got David Cameron, Old Etonian. And so you have gone back mm. to the old boys club. And I bet you, you know, Nadine Doris is allegedly out flogging a book at the moment will be kind of leaping on that and they will, but it will resonate with a certain section of people who think oh my god the conservative party is back to that era given up on populism right pater paternalistic so liberalism we raised is that back. question didn't we on the news agents a couple of months ago was whether rishi sunak was turning into a populist or, or becoming more of the populist of the kind that that liz truss had been and and boris johnson had been and i think the one thing you can say about Rishi Sunak is there is a chameleon quality to him that you think when he's got Suella Braverman in his, you know, cabinet as Home Secretary, that he agrees with everything she's saying. Now you're going to see him, I think, try and find a more statesmanlike position. I think he's using David Cameron to find his own statesmanlike quality. And part of that is bridging the gap. It's it's the David Cameron is the physical embodiment, if you like, of the Windsor framework. He's the idea that you can work with Brexiteers and Remainers and that somehow it's more important to have a kind of collegiate environment around you than people who are just like buzzing in your ear and wasping around and, and trying to destroy the fabric of sort of democracy in the country. Well, quite what, it say, what it says, I mean, I think it is a huge moment for the Sunak Premiership, right? It's probably one of the biggest moment and we keep talking about how many moments he's got before the election you know whether it was the the king's speech or the par party conference speech the autumn statement to come one more budget one more reshuffle he's using up these lives one by one in this he has created a moment that people certainly within westminster and to some extent elsewhere will take some notice of that's important he is making a clear signal or sending a clear signal about the sort of conservatism and the sort of conservative party that will be his Conservative Party going into the election. And in that sense, it is back to the future. There has been this big schism within Downing Street, within the Conservative Party, and question about, do you try and reassemble the 2019 coalition that Boris Johnson assembled in, mm. in that year and then in that election? Can Sunak adequately do that? This is clearly the strongest signal that in very little time, they are moving away from that strategy and moving to try and do something that is more akin to 2015. And what better what better man to bring back into the cabinet than the guy who won that election? The question is, though, is whether the 2015 electoral coalition, those kind of more liberal conservative voters, particularly in southern England, the question is, is whether they are really there anymore, whether too much water has passed under the bridge. Quite Since frankly, then, David Cameron, it ain't 20, as a risk of well, saying, obvious, Cameron, it's not 2015 well, David anymore. David Cameron straddles that unique position where he is reviled by people who wanted to remain in the European Union because they don't forgive him for having given the referendum in the first place. I know all sorts of people who quite liked David Cameron's politics and found him, you know, kind of very acceptable and the con continuity of Tony Blair, actually, but who kind of can't forgive him for having called yeah. the Brexit referendum it, and leading the, to it. And the, then you've got all the Brexiteers who think you were the bloody sod who told us we had to stay. This is from July, and this is um, an Ipsos Mori prime ministerial performance poll. And it's really interesting that the most unpopular Conservative prime ministers, I mean, it goes back to, to Thatcher, who does very well on this, with 46% of the population thinking she was better. Liz Truss comes out with a 72% think she made Britain worse. And Boris Johnson comes out with a 62% who think that they made Britain worse. David Cameron is on 45. So he's the third least popular of the Conservative prime ministers I mean. since yeah. Thatcher. Just to your point, yeah. which is that he's actually, you can't, he please, a you can't please all the people all the time. And he hasn't pleased any of the people, any of the time right now. Yes, he won. Yes, he was seen as the moderate. But also going back to your point, Lewis, you're asking whether, if you like, the southern blue wall Tories are. Don't forget, they've lost their MPs because they all got kicked out I mean. of the party. The party's under changed. Boris Johnson, right. And you know, the sort of the people like Nicholas Soames, the people like um, uh, Rory Stewart, the people like Amber Rudd, you know, they've all gone now. Dominic Grieve. Dominic sort of... Grieve, the people who, who actually held a constituency for... David Cameron, and, and the no would be seen. And I in mean, terms obviously, of, in, Soames and the Lords, but most of them just left the party altogether. And in terms of Cameron's um, own reputation with the public, I actually think this has been unfair given the circumstances. But there was this feeling in the aftermath of 2016 that he just disappeared. 
and he created this damage and that he'd just gone. I think that was unfair because there was no way his position was tenable. But there was that famous Danny Dyer clip, you'll remember, about trotters where... Trotters up. Yeah, you got your trotters up. This whole Brexit thing, when, when, when mm. you know, you're judging them on, on, on Brexit, they don't know nothing about it. Who knows about Brexit? Yeah, quite. Uh, no one's got a f***ing clue what Brexit mm. is, yeah? You watch Question Time, it's comedy. Were you no clearer when Jeremy Corbyn... No, I got the clue. Politics. No one knows what it is. It's like this mad riddle that no one knows mm. what it is, right? Mm. So what's happened to that... David Cameron, oh. who called it on. <laughs> Let's be fair. Oh. I think what? you're referring no, to no. our former no, Prime no. Minister. Yeah, but why the, how comes he can scuttle off? He called all this on. Mm. Yeah. yeah. He, he has no regrets. Where's, where is he? He's in Europe, in Nice, with his trotters up. Yeah? Where is the geezer? I think he should be held account for it. He should be held you know what? account it's for a, it. It's a valid point. A lot of people do feel <laughs> that all politicians... And it sort of embodied something and in terms and crystallised how the public felt with, about him. And I think that feeds into that. I think that the thing is, in terms of what this means, it is going to be a big coup with how this reshuffle is internalised. The Westminster village will be very excited about it. We're all very excited about it. It will, uh, as I say, give favourable coverage to him. In terms of shifting the polls, it's not going to change any of the fundamentals. It's not going to change anything in terms of how people are, think about the economy. Lewis, it's not going to change anything in terms of how people think about politics overall. What it okay. might do over the long Lewis, term... Lewis, can we just come on, in? Just Therese go- Coffee has gone. So I was going to break that news. Oh, go on, you break it now then. It's nearly 10 to 1, <laughs> and we can give you breaking news here on the news agents. Therese Coffey, who came up Downing Street looking smart this morning, has been fired. So that was pretty humiliating. Extraordinary, really. Why not- did you bring her up Downing Street to give her the sack? This idea that just because maybe you've floated sh- into our rivers and seas, you somehow can't serve in the cabinet. And people can eat turnips, remember. <laughs> well, indeed. She was that. <laughs> was about that. Yeah. Oh, God, the legacy of some of these people you know what? is just she so is, rich, isn't she, it? Therese is the Thelma to Liz Truss's <laughs> Louise, and they've both, I think, ended up in the canyon now. They were the, the best friend duo. Don't forget, she was the deputy PM to Liz Truss, so I think she was slightly a, a hangover from that time. Someone told me that uh, Therese Coffey's own private office had sent her to number 10 by accident. <gasps> and that they were meant to send Fantastic. her to the PM's parliamentary office to be sacked. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's delicious. So that's why everyone's going, well, she hasn't come out of Downing Street. Mm. Where is she? Well, it's because maybe she's accidental. gone out of the back door. Uh, maybe not. I'm sorry, there's one bit I've just got to say <laughs> that can't let stand. You cannot, cannot, cannot have Therese Coffey and Liz Truss as Thelma and Louise. <laughs> I love Thelma and Louise. <laughs> and I'm not saying I don't like Therese Coffey and Liz Truss, but they are not Thelma and Louise. We, sh- we should just talk about what a big moment is for Cameron personally, right? I mean, this is a guy who, since he left office in 2016, in a way that he didn't expect to happen, he was the youngest prime minister since Lord Liverpool. He was the youngest ex-prime minister that anybody could remember. I think he was only 50, 51. And he's basically spent the last, what, six, seven years not having a great deal to do. <laughs> he's been playing tennis. He's been, you know, trying to... I mean, there's a story that just does around where he keeps sort of ringing up some of his friends saying, oh, do you fancy playing tennis? And they say, well, no, Dave, because I've got a job. I, you know, I'm a bit busy. I can't in the middle of the day. I think it is and very hard if you've been very such hard. a young Prime Minister. He was so successful at such he, a young he age. Left, I mean, you know, famously left with that little whistle when he hadn't intended to be leaving Downing Street. No. They thought they were going to win the election. He thought he was going to finish the term, all the rest of it. So and much. actually, t- to leave in your just 50, I think, late 40s, just 50, 50, 50, when you compare that to Biden or to Trump yeah. in the US and you think, just getting going. oh my God. The thing is, it is a moment potentially for him of political redemption, right? Because he left office in a way that he didn't anticipate. And this is an opportunity for something which you so rarely get in British politics these days. It's so rare in British act. politics. In American politics happens much, even though think, the famous phrase is there are no second acts really in American life. I think redemption is a really interesting thing because there'll be many who remember the FT story about Greensill. the money he made from Greensill and his lobbying. And they will also say, well, hang on, you don't just get to come in through the Lords. If you're making foreign policy for this country, why can't you be questioned in the Commons? Why, why don't you have a constituency? Why don't you have people who can actually ask you direct questions? We can't do that what, to ministers who are in the Lords. One other effect of today, which is that um, as a result of Braverman sacking, this is the first time since 2010 that there's been no woman in any of the great offices of state. That goes back to your patrician state. Exactly. Well, look, after the break, we're going to be back and we will, of course, have to talk about dear Suella. Well, we've got to talk about Suella now. It's hard to know where to start, isn't it? I mean, last week, kind of quiet week for Suella. 
you know homelessness <laughs> was a lifestyle that wasn't included in the king's speech and then we had a doing an op-ed piece for the times newspaper and you know talking about the police having favorites and not also, really policing things. this was her big week because we're still waiting for the decision from the supreme court on the rwanda deportation on scheme now if it goes her way her dream you know her the dream. martin luther king of cabinet as was <laughs> she will be very sad to miss this and if it doesn't go her way which we were kind of we, we've sort of you know we think is not is going to happen it won't go her way then she becomes the person standing up and saying let's get out of every other body that we can possibly think of like the european convention on human rights right so either way she misses the big moment and james lucky cleverly gets to pick up the sh we said on the show last week she wasn't going to make it to the election she hasn't made it literally into the end of ne the following week. And the question now really for her, I think that, you know, we all said last week, it was very hard to see how Sunak could keep her in his cabinet when she so repeatedly challenged his authority. Even just yesterday, after the terrible events we saw at the weekend, she sends a series of tweets which condemn explicitly the anti-Semitism, which was on the march, and I went to it, and there definitely was some there, but she doesn't explicitly condemn the Islamophobia of the far right. She says nothing for days anyway, or for 24 hours after the protest, which she undoubtedly had made more difficult, had made harder as a result of her actions last week. This was just an untenable and unsustainable situation. She, she's actually said since she's been sacked that she will have, she's warned, she'll she will have, have more, more to say. say. That, how amazing. <laughs> I know. This is the sort of tremors that go through you, which I think also explains the positioning of David Cameron, as we were saying in the first half, actually, Rishi Sunak just doesn't want that to be the front page tomorrow. There is another story to tell. And also, she sort of becomes David Cameron's problem as well. You know, that, that whatever she says now, Rishi Sunak feels he's got an ally in David Cameron in terms of a sort of back-in-your-box type grown-up to just shut her well, down. What, what, this, what this reshuffle has done and Braverman's removal is that it has made the cabinet and will make his gov government more kind of ideologically contiguous. It is more... The, all of the government will be more like Sunak. It will be more like his personal style. It will look and sound more like him and the particular type of conservatism and slightly more institutional conservatism that he embodies. More male. More male, yes, indeed. And in a way, that is good. And what I was saying before is is that there's no... Look, this isn't going to move the polls, putting Cameron back in there. Like I say, he's far too checkered a figure for that to happen. I, what Downing Street's bet is, is that it enables his government to appear more professional, that it enables his government to appear to be more of a unit. Just getting grown-ups in, isn't well, it? Well, it's that idea, exactly. And the hopefully the, the economy turns and you get rid of the barnacles on the boat, as Linton Crosby used to say, and you stop the sort of needless controversy and you get to the election, hope the economy is turned, and that gives you the best chance you the can. The interesting thing flip is side of it, I was just saying, the flip side of it, the flip side of it is that Cameron, is that by making your government more contiguous, making it more like you, it means that you have more division within the Conservative Party. Sure, she is outside of the tent. And we're already hearing rumours this afternoon that particular like-minded Conservative MPs will be meeting this afternoon to even discuss a potential leadership if, challenge for Suella you know against what? Sunak. If I was Rishi Sunak, I wouldn't be that worried right now about Suella. There was a great line, I think it was Tim Shipman's piece in the Sunday Times, that said they'd had this common sense meeting of Suella. And seven turned. Seven had come. That's yeah. not a big threat. And I think it's not surprising that from Suella, we always got the sense of amplification, that she was speaking for millions. She was speaking for the country. She was the only honest politician that could tell the truth and had this huge constituency. I'm not really sure how big that constituency is. But I think the other thing about David Cameron, just to finish, is that we actually don't know his views on any of this stuff. We know what he thinks about HS2. We don't really know where he sits on Rwanda. I mean, don't forget, he left. He left being an MP in the October of 2016, right? So since then, we haven't really understood what he thinks about, you know, the asylum question, the immigration question, the small boats question. We can guess. But is he now accountable for all the well, other things that Rishi Sunak is doing? Well, he'll right? have to, right? Because it'll yeah. be a collective responsibility. I do think that, going back to Suella, though, you don't need many people to cause a lot of trouble. They're very noisy. You know, you there are yeah, very few people... that's noise. Yeah, but noise gives you an impression of division, of a divided party, of the bitterness that exists within there. And, you know, if they can't all get behind mm. Rishi Sunak now, and that they have the, they have the negative power to destroy... If, as Lewis says, and I think it's absolutely right, that what this is about now is we're a party of grown-ups, we're mature, tough times ahead, we need tough people to make the tough a decisions. Discipline, actually. And discipline. Yeah. Then we've got that with Cameron. 
But you can have that so undermined so easily. You know, Liz Truss is still in Parliament. The Suella's there. <laughs> well, Lee, Lee Anderson is still the Lee deputy Anderson. chairman, right? Well, I mean, that, oh, that, watch that space. Well, I mean, that that cannot still stand, surely. The point is, right, is that, yes, it is true. I mean, you're right. It is true that in terms of the parliamentary party, there is a far bigger section of the Conservative parliamentary party that we don't hear from nearly as much, which was deeply exasperated with Suella, that wanted her gone. We were saying that on the show on Friday, and you they're not as noisy. But there is one crucial difference and one sense in which Suella Braverman is much more representative than she is of the country or of the mm. parliamentary party. In 2023, the Conservative Party, in terms of its grassroots, is far more aligned to Suella Bravman than it is David Cameron. And the Conservative press, which has yes. gone down this deeply kind of, yes, populist, but also kind of anti-institutional, quite weird type of politics, is far more aligned to Suella Bravman than of it course. is David Cameron. So the Mail, so she the Express, has a the Telegraph, I mean, where are they going to be? Because they, well, were, don't, don't forget, they were rowing uh, in behind. Don't, I, mean, I know yeah. they'll go behind any Tory leader. Not anyone. I mean, don't forget, famous. Famously, well, this is a story we broke on Newsnight about a decade ago, nearly a decade ago, uh, David Cameron tried to get Paul Dacre fired from the mail 100%. ahead of the EU referendum. So Cameron. there probably isn't that much warmth what, there for the new foreign secretary. What did they, the Daily Mail, what was on their headline, what, on uh, Friday? Don't sack. If you come for Suella, you yeah. come for all of us. And then not only into that, not only is he sacked Suella... But he's replaced her in the top tier of the cabinet with David Cameron, someone Paul Dacre, as you say, Emily. Yeah. Loads. What, one thing I think that, that we might see, though, is more people who are more aligned with moderate conservatism within the parliamentary party now feeling more able to speak out. I think yeah. with Suella gone, there is a sense of the old, you know, the, the house has landed on the witch's, wicked witch's legs. Forgive me. But, you know, that that's kind of how a lot in her party will see her. And I think that there might be a sort of courage that comes from a going, reassertion. this is our party back. OK, you will hear me speaking out. You will start to see people like, you know, the Julian Smiths, the Damien Greens, the people who you think of as the centrists who've been quite quiet over the last couple of years might now feel emboldened. Yeah. I wonder whether Nigel Farage will be th rethinking going to the jungle and thinking there's an opportunity here with the Tory, Tory party <laughs> having gone to the centre that this is Reform UK's big moment and we can come back and storm because the Tory party has gone back to the era of Cameron. Not I think David for... Cameron needs that 1.5 million for his little coots account right now from the sound of it. Not uh, too late for Suella to end up in the jungle of course. Last minute bid from Anton Deck and the ITV producers. I'm sure she'd do extremely you'd actually, well. You'd actually pay to see them both in there together. <laughs> I think they would richly deserve each other and the, you know, kangaroo's testicles. We'll be back in just a moment. Well, as you've probably worked out by now, we are recording this in real time and we are learning things about the reshuffle as we are speaking. And one of the things that we couldn't quite work out was the Therese Coffey situation because she seemed to be spending an awful long time in Downing Street with the Prime Minister. And that normally indicates that a wrangle of sorts is going on. We saw it, I think, when Jeremy Hunt was being offered defence instead of Foreign Secretary under Boris Johnson and he actually refused to go and resign. And that was a long time of us watching that door and wondering what was going on there. Therese Coffey, we've now learned, was offered another job. Don't yet know what that is. Maybe a junior ministerial role. Much more role, junior role. But doesn't allow her to put as much shit in the rivers and the sea. So clearly <laughs> unfulfilling in that respect. And decided that she would resign instead. Well, I think that, that you know, successive reshuffles, it's always the nightmare job for the prime minister, the private secretary, the chief of staff. Because you're playing a three-dimensional chess game. Because Post you're, note. yeah, you're, you're <laughs> assuming that everyone's going to say yes to the job they're offered. And when people say no, I don't want that, or I want this instead of that, then you've got to figure out what you're going to do. And I think it's kind of telling that Therese Coffey was in there for a long time, clearly mm -hmm. trying to fight for something that she hasn't got. And so ultimately, it's come down to Rishi Sunak saying to her, "It's take it or leave it," and she said, "Well, I'll leave it then." So here's a little bit of trivia now we can do. Oh, go, go on. on, go on, go on. What does today's um, appointment of Cameron mean in terms of Tony Blair's position uh, or historical trivia around Tony Blair? Oh, he's the only Prime Minister never to have had cabinet experience apart from his own role. That's right. Tony Blair is now the only Prime Minister since the 19th century not to have had, not another to have served department. in another Prime Minister's cabinet. Because it was I mean, kept you, you raised something really interesting by mentioning Tony Blair, which is, and we haven't really talked about it, touched on it in this episode, which is the Middle East. And there were a lot of indications that Tony Blair is being asked in, welcomed in perhaps by the Israeli government to try and 
I mean, I know there will be people. Yeah, there will be either. people picking off the, their jaw off the floor at this. But the idea that Tony Blair would be invited back into the Middle East to sort out peace. But this is one of the uh, one of the sort of rumours coming out of the Israeli government right now. I wonder if David Cameron is also seeing his own role actually at a time when we've got two wars on the edge of Europe, and maybe David Cameron's thinking, well. Actually, I could offer something there. I, I do know the players in Ukraine and Russia. I do know the players in the Middle East and Israel, right? Yeah, it's, look, it's not I a terrible thing. I think it's hard to exaggerate the sense in which ex-prime ministers, and look, we meet them from time to time and we see these guys around, want relevance. And they still, they, they did the job as prime minister. And you've got lots to offer. And you've still got lots to offer. You've still got youth. You've still got vitality. You've well, still you've got energy. You've finally and got you all want, the experience. And, and what do you do with it? Exactly. Right? That's Blair's riff. That, yeah. you know, I get made prime minister when I'm least experienced and least you know able nothing. to do the job. And I get kicked out at the moment when I understand it most and I yeah. know how the machine works. Yeah. And, and bringing Cameron back potentially is a very smart move. I mean, it looks like a job creation programme for former prime ministers, so that maybe there'll be fewer of them at the Cenotaph on November the The only 11th. way today could have been better is if he'd made Theresa May Home, Home Secretary. Secretary. <laughs> <laughs> John Major John education. Major's in the wings. Yeah. yeah. Come on, John. Time's come well, to come back. Know. What about into environment yet? Yeah, we? that's true, actually. Who's going to replace <laughs> Therese Coffey? John, yeah. got a good job for you. Liz, Liz, Liz Truss, yeah. advising mm. the Argentinian finance back ministry. Chancellor. I mean, that would be a good move for her. <laughs> but before we go, and we really have to put on the solemn voice now. minute silence minute silence. moment silence she voice. does like respect yeah. um, remembrance it's remembrance. time now to remember Suella Bravman through the eyes and the mouth of some of our guests oh I don't know why Suella Braverman does anything she doesn't know what she's talking about nine times out of ten she certainly doesn't know anything about her own department does the Home Secretary have your confidence <sighs> do you and have confidence in her comes. I, I, um, I want to have. And I have to say I have been bitterly disappointed by some of the rhetoric coming out from government, in particular Suella Braverman, and shame on them. You now we've seen a series of, you know, interventions from her, which, you know, have been in danger of crossing that line. No, she's not fit to be Home Secretary. I can't speak for why Suella Braverman says anything. I mean, I think she's probably chasing headlines and rather than dealing with the front line. Did you think it was a mistake for the Prime Minister to invite her back in so shortly after having broken the ministerial code? I, 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 do, I do really think it was a mistake because it's led to all this controversy. And Suella's trying to create headlines because she wants to be seen as the successor to Sinek. I do think she's guilty of hate speech. This needs to come to a head. It's doing quite a lot of damage. We cannot have senior members of the cabinet on the face of it defying number 10 and applying her own agenda. And you know what? Like, in a way, that was supposed to be a bit of a joke, but it actually perfectly encapsulates why she's gone. Is because even on our show, day after day, what a massive character she has been, each and every one of those people constantly essentially saying that she's done something wrong and hogging the limelight, hogging the attention of the government. And that is what this is partly about. It's in the run up to the election, having what the word you said, Emily, uh, you said, Emily, discipline, a discipline which she was clearly incapable Do you know what's of funny? providing. This time last week, Lewis, I was in America, you were here and we were talking about the last controversy, the Suella Tent thing, right? Yeah. And it's amazing to think that maybe everything she said in the lead up to Saturday's march was just to try and give her cover to make people forget about the lifestyle choice of the homeless having tents. I mean, it's not impossible that everything that she said has just been to cover up the last terrible thing she said to make people forget it. Well, she is a casualty of the culture wars because she has been struck down. She'll be back. I'll yeah, be back. But for the moment, not a great day for Suella Braverman. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 